<laughs> Mark, can I ask you, how does it feel when they call your name at the Oscars and you've won? Uh, I think probably like the best feeling on earth. I uh, can't imagine anything, you know, much better really. It feels awesome. Really, really feels great. And then to have, have it happen, happen again? To have it happen a yeah, second so time, it's almost like, uh, I don't know, other people have said that to me. If you've won it yeah. once, then, you know, you kind of, it's like a bug, you know, you don't like really want to win it again. But uh, I never thought I'd win one the first time, so it's such a pleasure, you know, just, just total, total pleasure, especially up against such uh, stiff competition as well, you know. How did you prepare for that process? Would you be able to share a little bit with us? Oh, um, the first time, um, it was almost like, um, at first I thought, oh, we'll never, we'll never win it. It's going to be Harry Potter that wins it. Um, and then as time went on, and from what people were saying to us, you know, I realised that we did have a chance with the Iron Lady, you know, that, that it was going to be, you know, it was a possibility. And that's when you start thinking, oh God, I really want to win it. <laughs> and then all the negative things that come with that, you know, so you basically then try and convince yourself that you're not going to win it so that you're not too disappointed. Does that make sense? Absolutely. But that moment, that dawn of realisation when they called your name, did you have a speech prepared? Um, I didn't have one. I had a real basic one. I didn't have anything written down, you know, I just had a basic, because you only get about 20 seconds anyway, so there's not really much to learn. Just thank a few people and, and that's it. Really. And this time I really wanted to, uh, I really wanted to thank Dick Smith, you know, who was, who died last year, you know. Mm. Yes. Um, just for, for, you know, doing what he did in our industry, you know, and just paving the way for everybody else, you know, his generosity and everything else. So I really wanted to, that was the main thing really, thank, thank, thank my crew and thank people and just thank Dick Smith. Obviously you've just come, uh, this is the first inaugural um, event for Creature Garden. So yeah. It kind of feels a little bit like a British version of Monster Palooza. That's right. Um, real enthusiasm and excitement here, real buzz. What attracted you to come initially? Oh, like I said before, you know, just uh, I like to, um, I mean, it, I've been asked at IMAX to do makeup demonstrations and all sorts, but it's always coincided with uh, the timing of this was just was just right that I was able to uh, I was able to uh, devote a bit of time to prep something. You know, because quite often I'm just too busy to get involved with. So I usually say no, I'm not going to stick a makeup on, but I'll come and do a talk. You know, which is great. You can just turn up on the day and and do a little talk. You know, but uh, actually sticking a makeup on involves like me giving up my Saturday yesterday and. Uh, a couple of days last week getting a set of pieces prepared and you know that's a bit more it's a bit more effort and when you're really busy it's really hard to find that time you know so it was basically a bit of opportunity and also because uh, it seemed like it was going to be a really cool event you know I'm friends with David Power and he was organizing it and so yeah we all came together well, it, it was like the rock star of makeup was coming because they started queuing an hour and a half before your <laughs> arrival. So I know that it was really, really appreciated. Um, you I'm, talked I wonder earlier. if they still feel like that. <laughs> I think there's still a lot like... of buzz going on right now. Um, you queued you up for that. Earlier about um, kind of the, the, the challenges now that face sorry, practical makeup sorry. effects versus the digital world. But you gave really great encouragement that there's still room for new entrants, that there's still work available and, and people should just keep trying. What, what's the top three pieces of advice you'd give a new, in, a new entrant to the industry today? Uh, well, I think the main one is work hard. Work harder than everyone else who you're competing with. Um, and the other one is, uh, you know, just keep um, practicing, um, build up the reference, uh, and keep a sketchbook and draw and paint, and you know. But it's really, it's really important that people understand that they have to, that they've got to work hard. There's no easy way around. If people go to into a, make, a workshop environment, sit around chatting all day, and don't like knuckle under and be quiet and work all day diligently they won't get rehired you know they're they're like I think a lot of people 
especially out of makeup colleges, tend to think that they're going to go in and start sculpting and painting straight away. And they're not. They're going to go in and they're going to be cleaning moulds out. They're going to be emptying bins, sweeping floors. Um, and if they do that well, then uh, just close your eyes, pull them. If they do that well, then they'll move on to the next thing. You know. So it's about building confidence and and allowing those in senior positions to see your dedication essentially. Exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because if you're not dedicated enough to empty a bin or sweep the floor, sorry Paul, stop it. Stop. Sorry. Yeah. People are just gonna think, well, you're not gonna you're gonna sculpt in the same way that you empty bins, you know? <laughs> Half heartedly. Mm. Obviously you're team working right now in this removal of this fantastic makeup and you talked a lot about collaboration, team working. I know when you worked on The Iron Lady, obviously there was a team of you, there was a hair artist, there was yourself on prosthetics and obviously Meryl Streep's own personal makeup artist. The three of you working very much in tandem. Yeah. When you're actually in that, in that chair environment on set prepping the artist for the morning, do you begin to work intuitively as a team? Um, with most people, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, especially so most experienced people, you know. Um, it just works naturally, you know. You do your bit, the hair, hair person does their bit, you know. Every, we're all specialists in our particular bit, so we all do our specialised bit. And what I've learned over, you know, 30 years of doing it is that you can't be perfect at everything, however much you want to be as good a hairdresser as the hairdresser or as good a hairdresser you're not you know we're not hairdressers that you know i'm not a hairdresser i've done i've studied it at college let it leave it to the hair the, the experts you know it's a whole lifetime of, of of hair and makeup tips and tricks and all sorts of stuff that, that, that you can't know everything you know that, that's the thing you can't know everything and prosthetics is so involved that you know you can spend your whole life like I do doing prosthetics you know you don't have time to spend your life devoting it to hair makeup prosthetics and and cover every cover all the bases so you, you have to you realize at some point that you let people specialize let people do what they do well you know You've got hair if you want some beautiful 18th century hairstyles then get somebody who's good at it you know because your prosthetics guys are not going to be able to do that here like that. So on, on Grand Budapest Hotel, everybody did their own. Everybody did their own bit, you know. The wig looks amazing that Francis got involved in, and we did our aging makeup, and uh, Norma Webb was involved, and you know the whole thing came together as as a as a team. Sorry, not Norma Webb, uh, Julie Darnell, uh, and it all came together, you know, on the day. Could I ask you also, that makeup for Tilda Swinton was something quite extraordinary, that translucency to the skin. Yeah. In, in someone who was 53 that you transformed into 84, I believe. Yeah. How did you achieve that? Um, I think it's just, you know, we kept the translucency up a little bit. It was all a bit exaggerated, that makeup, you know. Um, everything was a bit exaggerated. I mean, Wes wanted so many liver spots on there and kept wanting, wanting more and more and more. So we made it a little bit more translucent than normal. We, we added a bit more jowly, jowliness to it. We did a stretch and stipple around the eyes that was a bit exaggerated. Everything was a bit exaggerated, really, which was, which was great. It all lent itself to a character out of a Wes Anderson film rather than an old age, a, 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 a Tilda Swinton old age maker. It wasn't, that's what it, it wasn't that. Good. He wasn't bothered whether you recognised Tilda or not, you know, so we were able to just do what so we really, wanted really. Yeah. Yeah. Just push it all a little bit further. So that, that, that was nice. Oh, it was a nice yeah. character. Yeah. It seems to be. Mm, that's that's so much like moisture there. And last of all, yeah, I mean, maybe. Maybe. It's all right. just, um, yeah. if you hadn't done this, if this hadn't been your career, is there anything any other burning ambition that you, you oh, have? Oh, I'd, I'd just be painting or drawing or something, you know. Um, as, long as, some, as long as it involves some kind of artwork somewhere. Or I'd be test driving fast cars. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know there's the, the recent BBC programme that's looking for a new presenter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd love to do that. Um, a great job. Just last week. Yeah, you <laughs> yeah, I could be this. <laughs>
Okay. Well, you mentioned Again, another <laughs> um, production that had the word stig in it, stig of the dump, which had quite traumatic memories for you. <laughs> yeah, to say the least. And and that you know those situations happen on set a lot, and it was truly <coughs> horrendous. How do you manage that? How do you keep calm? I don't know. Um, I've got quite a good ability to keep relatively calm. It takes a lot to frazzle me. Do you think that's I mean, I, I just I go back to that <laughs> old adage that uh, Stuart Freeborn said, and Nick Dubbin passed on to me, and it was, it was these are hands, not wands. <laughs> this was his uh, was his uh, his final his thing, you know. And I, I just think it's that you're not you're not a magician. You're just there to do your bit. If you if your makeup's falling off after twelve hours, then the reason is it's been on for twelve hours. So you have to explain to them that you know there are some. You know, you're not a magician, you're just working with all the parameters and you do your best. And once you realise that actually they're filmmakers, all they want to do is make a film, they want to get their shot. So they, they will, you know, if you warn them in advance so they can reschedule stuff, and get, you realise that actually everybody's working to the, the same goal at the end, you know. And they know that you're not, you know, that, that prosthetics have well, those abilities, you know. <laughs> they know that edges start to show after lunch and, you know, they go in for their big time class at the end of the day and, you know, that's the hard bit to deal with. But in these days, you know, the digital touch-up helps here and there and, you know, you never get to a situation now whereby um, you have to stop filming on a makeup because the edges are showing somewhere around the mouth because they'll just tidy it up. Well, I know you said you're not a magician, but we've seen some magic this afternoon. Thank you so very, very much. Thanks, you've been so I had a full of broccoli. Yeah,